application must be taken into account. Thank you. That ends general questions. Before we come to the next item of business, I'm sure members will join me in welcoming to the gallery the Speaker of the Legislative Assembly of British Columbia, Columbia the Honourable Linda Reid, MLA, and the Ambassador of Belarus, His Excellency Mr Sergei Alenik. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and welcoming the Deputy First Minister to her position. May I ask her what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day? Deputy First Minister. Can I thank Joanne Lamont for her welcome and advise her that I have engagements today to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Joanne Lamont. Thank you. Presiding Officer, the Deputy First Minister and I know Govan Shipyard well. And I'm sure she shares with me the bittersweet feeling about yesterday's announcement by the UK Defence Secretary. Great sadness for the 840 families who will lose their jobs and, of course, for their colleagues in Portsmouth. But a degree of relief that shipbuilding in the Clyde does have a future. Can the Deputy First Minister tell us what steps the Scottish Government is taking to secure the future of our shipyards? Deputy First Minister. Can I uh, firstly join with Joanne Lamont in expressing deep regret at yesterday's announcement? She's absolutely correct. There had been mounting speculation that Govan Shipyard was under threat of closure, and there is an element of relief that that did not turn out to be the case. But 800 job losses across uh, the Clyde and Drysyth is clearly a devastating blow for the shipbuilding industry and uh, for the communities affected, as she uh, rightly says we both know uh, the shipyard and those who work uh, within it very well indeed and I want to put on record today the fact that the Scottish Government's thoughts are with all those in Govan, Scotland and Andrasyth who are affected by this announcement. Uh, the Finance Secretary yesterday had uh, discussions with BAE and with the unions. I understand he briefed Joanne Lamont this morning on the content of his discussions with the company. Uh, the Finance Secretary and I will be meeting uh, face to face tomorrow morning with BAE and indeed with with the unions uh, represented. Uh, we will do everything as the Scottish Government working uh, with the company, with the unions and indeed with the UK Government to uh, protect as many jobs as possible and also to give as much support as we possibly can to those uh, affected. I think uh, people across the chamber would expect no less of us. In terms of the longer term uh, future of the shipyard, I'm sure we'll get into this discussion in greater depth as uh, question time develops today. Uh, I do believe that the Scottish shipbuilding industry uh, does have, should have and must have a strong and secure future. Naval procurement is part of that future. But I believe if we want to build the security and the sustainability of our shipbuilding industry, we must also think beyond naval procurement. Uh, I look at Norway, uh, a country similar in size to Scotland with 42 shipyards that built 100 ships last year. So I'm not saying it will be easy, but with the political will and with consensus I hope we can gather across this chamber, all of us should be determined to build that future for our shipyards and for all of those who work within them. Joanne Lamont. We know that work will continue in the Clyde on the aircraft carriers. We also know that 2,500 jobs will be sustained as a result of the order for three new ocean patrol vessels. Beyond that, it is vital that Clyde shipyards secure the work to build the Type 26 frigates. We know what the Deputy First Minister thinks will happen and hopes will happen. We know what she would like to happen. But can she tell us what discussions the Scottish Government has had with BAE and the UK Government about securing this work? And can she give my constituents and hers a guarantee that this work will come to the Clyde? Deputy First Minister. I just said earlier on that John Swinney and I will be meeting with the company tomorrow. I, as I know Joanne Lamont does, care deeply about the shipbuilding industry and the future of it. I will work with anybody, anywhere, to secure the future of an industry that I think is very important to Scotland, practically and indeed emotionally. And can I also say that my heart goes out to the people of Portsmouth because I know that their yeah. shipbuilding industry yeah. is as important to them as the Clydes is to us. The problem we have is that naval procurement alone, however important, is not enough, as we saw yesterday with the further downsizing of our shipbuilding industry, yeah. is not enough to secure that future beyond, not just for 10 years, but 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and that's what I want to do. Now, this uh, issue about whether or not the Type 26 frigates would be built on the Clyde in an independent Scotland. Let me deal with that directly, and I'd say two things. Firstly, what we heard yesterday from BAE 
and from the Secretary of State for Defence is that the Clyde is the best place to build those ships. End of story. Secondly, the UK government would have nowhere else to build these ships. But you know, I found I found something quite interesting uh, this morning. It's, it's a press release on the Royal Navy website, and it's headed Britain and Australia to work together to create frigates of the future. Ah. It starts by saying this, among the closer cooperation between the two countries' military, we'll be seeing whether we can work jointly on the Royal Navy's Type 26 oh. global combat oh. ship. Oh. On a visit, Philip Hammond, on a visit to BAE Systems Shipyard in Perth, Australia, said this, and I'm quoting directly. He said, areas of potential cooperation include future frigates, frigates with the Royal Navy's Type 26 design, the first of many opportunities for future collaboration. In times of budget pressures for all nations, it makes sense to maximise economies of scale and work with our friends to get the best value for money on all sides. So I would ask Joanne Lamont to explain to me, in all seriousness, in very simple terms, why it should be OK for the UK government to collaborate with a country at 10,000 miles away, but collaboration between two countries that share the same island would not be the case. Joanne Lamont, as the constituency MSP for Govan Shipyard, should be getting behind the shipyard to say it's the best place to build the Type 26 frigates, regardless of the outcome of next year's vote. Joanne Lamont. Ms Lamont, order. Ms Lamont. The fact of the matter is, we currently have joint procurement. It's called the United yeah. Kingdom. <laughs> what, what the Deputy First Minister wants to do is to break that up and then reinvent it and pretend there's not a difficulty. Yes, Govan is the best in the United Kingdom. I want Govan to stay in the United Kingdom so that they can benefit from that proposal. <laughs> Because you see the problem, and I don't d doubt the personal commitment of the Deputy First Minister to the individuals within Govan Shipyard, but her problem is her prospectus for Scotland threatens them and her jobs, their jobs. If I were her, if I were her, faced with that consequence of her prospectus, I would change that prospectus rather than explaining away the concerns of those within the industry who are now highlighting these matters. The Deputy First Minister has spoken about diversification, but you need a base to work from in order to build to diversification, and it is the consequence while that was happening. But given that naval contracts could dry up within a few short years. What discussions has she had with BAE about diversifying work on the Clyde? Does she have a diversification plan ready to be put in place? And can she tell the workers in my constituency when she anticipates that work on the first non-naval contracts will begin? Deputy First Minister. With the greatest respect to Joanne Lamont, let me, let me see firstly, John Swinney raised the issue of diversification uh, with BAE Systems yesterday when he spoke to them. I, I recall a, a joint meeting that John Swinney and I uh, had with the trade unions on the Clyde where diversification was one of the key issues that we discussed. We're not responsible for the running of the shipyards at the moment. The whole point I am making is that we need to build an alternative future for our shipyards. With naval procurement as a part, yes, but looking at what we do to boost exports, looking at what we do to diversify. And the point I am making that Joanne Lamont doesn't seem to be able to rebut in any way is that there are examples out there of other countries similar to Scotland that do this very well. So in the spirit of consensus, can I say to Joanne Lamont, we'd be delighted to work with her and anybody else across the chamber to start to look at that yeah. different future for our shipyards. Because I tell you this, and this is a point regardless of the outcome of next year's vote in a few years time even with the type 26 even with the type 26 we're seeing a downsizing of the shipbuilding industry and in a few years time we'll be asking ourselves what comes next because there's nothing in the mod locker after type 26 so this is a challenge for all of us whether scotland is independent or not if we want the future of our shipyard secured we have to work to find that away and on the point about defense jobs generally you know joanne lamont really should look at some of the figures and some of the evidence. Defence jobs are not being protected within the UK. We are seeing a disproportionate loss 
in defence jobs and facilities. Our shipbuilding industry is being downsized before our very eyes. That is the reality of the UK. The threat to defence jobs in Scotland is not independence, it is Westminster, and we are seeing that yeah, day yeah. and daily. <laughs> If this, only, if this were only a, an argument between the Deputy First Minister and I, that might be an acceptable answer. People are worried about their jobs and they deserve better than that. John Swinney and his party have been arguing for independence for 30 years. You think they might have spoken about diversification before yeah, yeah. yesterday. Before yesterday. Because even if you agree with their position, you know to move from one place to the other, you need a bridge to create that security. There is no diversification plan. It is simply a defence against the reality they are now facing. And it's not a reality just for us in this chamber, much more seriously for those who defend on these jobs. This morning, I spoke to the shop stewards convener at Talis. He described this position they are now in after yesterday's announcement as moving from uncertainty to vulnerability. That vulnerability is because the United Kingdom government has made it clear that defence contracts will not be let outside the United Kingdom and therefore, and therefore will not come to Scotland. I think people within the defence industry would prefer to hear this rather than hearing catcalling from yeah. the back benches. So let me say it again. It's made it clear that defence contracts will not be let outside the United Kingdom and therefore will not come to Scotland if Scotland is outside the United Kingdom to which you all aspire. The reality is that the United Kingdom has not built a warship outside the United Kingdom since the Second World War. If the Deputy First Minister is so sure these contracts would go ahead regardless, can she guarantee the rest of the United Kingdom that an independent Scotland would place orders for warships with English yards? I think we know the answer. So, Order. so can she Order. explain? Never mind, never mind what she hopes she aspires to believe in. Can she explain to my constituents and hers who work on the Clyde what will happen to their jobs should there be a yes vote? Can I, First Minister. Can I, and I, can I say to start with, I take no pleasure whatsoever in the statement I'm about to make. But the result for other parts of the UK of the UK Government's announcement yesterday is that there are no other shipyards in the UK where complex warships can be built. That's the result of the death knell that the UK Government sounded for Portsmouth yesterday. The Clyde is not only now the best place to build these ships, it is the only place in the UK to build these ships. And on the point about defence contracts not being let outside the UK. Uh, can I be uh, the first, amazingly the first, to tell Joanne Lamont that UK defence contracts are already let outside of the UK? You know, it's not that long ago that the MOD let a contract for a military vessel to Korea. The MOD leases, leases military vessels from Norway. She didn't mention my Australian example earlier on, but you know what? It's not just Australia. Here's something from a newspaper in India in 2011. The cash-strapped UK government has approached New Delhi to jointly design and build the Type 26 frigates. Ah. The Deputy Defence Minister in the House of Commons in January 2011, talking specifically about the Type 26. We're in discussion with Canada, Malaysia, Australia, <laughs> New Zealand, <laughs> Turkey. I'm going to quote all of these countries expressed interest in joining the UK in a collaborative programme that would bring together members of the Commonwealth while driving down costs for the Royal Navy. So is Joanne Lamont's point that it is only a future independent Scotland that the UK government wouldn't and couldn't collaborate with? But, you know, my last point is this. Joanne Lamont, I understand, doesn't support independence. I think I've got that message. <laughs> she will campaign hard against independence. I accept that. I even respect that. But this is a question about what happens after Scotland has democratically voted for independence. And surely she is not going to threaten 
and bully and seek to blackmail yeah. Scottish shipyards. Instead, surely she should be saying, in that scenario, the MOD should do the only thing, the right thing, the best thing. Here's what Jamie Webster, the convener of Govanyard, somebody who knows more about the Clyde than the rest of us put together, here's what he said. What I will say publicly, if the situation is that Scottish people, by democratic vote, vote yes, I would expect no sorry demand that every single politician supports us. So my question to Joanne yeah. Lamont is simple. Will she support the Clyde to build the frigates, even if we're independent? Yeah. Briefly, Ms Lamont. Order. Order. Briefly, Ms Lamont. I will always stand up for the constituents I represent. I will always stand up for the people of Scotland. The problem the Deputy First Minister has, once that vote is taken next year, we have no control or influence over what a UK government would do because we are not in it. She highlights all of these issues about how we can work with other people. They represent the current benefits of being in the United Kingdom, sharing risk, pooling resource, coming together in tough times and making sure not that we put government workers' jobs at risk, but make sure that we protect them in the future. Briefly, Deputy First Minister. The fact of the matter is, Joanne Lamont is not standing up for the Clyde. She's seeking to try and bully and blackmail yeah. people. Yeah. Ian Davidson is yeah. arguing for the contracts to be taken away if Scotland becomes independent. That's yeah. not standing up for the Clyde. Let me end, Presiding Officer, with referring her to the comment that her Deputy Leader Anas Sarwar made on television last night. He said this, and I quote, let's not make this a constitutional issue. Ah. That memo obviously didn't get to Joanne Lamont. It sounds as if she's even more out of the loop in her own party than we thought. Question number two, Ruth Davidson. Ms Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Deputy First Minister when she'll next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. Deputy First Minister. I have no immediate plans to meet the Secretary of State for Scotland, but I hope to do so before too long. Ms Davidson. Thank you. Uh, President Officer, may I add my deep regret over yesterday's jobs announcement uh, and say that the speculation uh, surrounding those job losses has been deeply unhelpful and it's added to the huge amounts of worry to workers uh, in my area of the Glasgow region and their families. Can I ask the, the Deputy First Minister, on reflection, does she now regret speculating publicly in the press last week that the entire Govan Yard could close, adding immeasurably to the worry of the workers there? Deputy First Minister. Well, you know, if, if Ruth Davidson, who is a, a Glasgow MSP, uh, knew anything uh, about the Govan Yard or the people who worked in the Govan Yard, she would know the level of anxiety, very, very real anxiety that existed within that yard last week about the potential closure of Govan Shipyard, uh, because that was a real possibility facing that yard. Uh, I will... Uh, I, no longer represent Govan Shipyard. That pleasure and privilege now falls to Joanne Lamont. But the Govan Shipyard will always have a special place in my heart. Uh, and no matter uh, whether I'm an MSP or not, no matter uh, who I represent, I will always do everything in my power to stand up for the fine men and women who work in that fantastic shipyard on the River Clyde. Ruth Davidson. Officer, both speakers uh, this afternoon have said that yesterday was a bittersweet uh, moment for shipbuilding in Scotland. Uh, and I am pleased that despite uh, those job losses announced yesterday, the Clyde has been reaffirmed as the centre for building UK warships for the Royal Navy. In the last 24 hours, I've had a number of conversations with the company and I'm pleased that BAE doesn't want the Clyde Yards to remain static. It will now make a multi-million pound investment into those sites to massively upgrade them and bring them into what they call the upper quartile of worldwide shipbuilding, creating a design and manufacturing centre of excellence on the Clyde. Simply put, it will elevate them to shipbuilding's Premier League. With all the earlier talk of diversification, the truth is that next generation complex warships are increasingly built by specialist yards, not generalists, like the yards making commercial vessels to which the Deputy First Minister referred. And without massive upgrades, the Clyde will not have full capability to build the tw Type 26, and the company cannot compete in the marketplace to supply the most advanced vessels to foreign navies. And the Yard's long-term future depends on both. I know, Presiding Officer, 
that the company is applying for grants from Scottish Enterprise and it says it needs support from the Scottish Government as the yards transform. Can the Deputy First Minister tell me what work the Scottish Government is doing now to make sure that, that assistance is there when it is needed? Deputy First Minister. Can I say that uh, we will, as I said earlier on in response to Joanne uh, Lamont, uh, we will be meeting directly with BE Systems uh, tomorrow and support for their investment plans at the Yard will be very much something that we want to uh, speak to them about. Scottish Enterprise already works very closely with BE Systems to provide all sorts of appropriate support uh, for the company and for their presence on the Clyde and that will uh, continue. I, I understand uh, that the BAs had RSA support in the uh, past. Let me say very clearly on the part of the Scottish Government that we will uh, give BAE Systems every support that we can that it needs to carry out that investment in the Clyde to help secure the future of the shipyards. That's what we want to see. I believe it's what everybody in this chamber wants to see. So let's unite around that and make sure we're doing everything in our power to make sure that our shipyards have a future, not just for the next 10 years, or slightly more than 10 years, that the Type 26 would secure, but a secure future for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years and beyond. That's what I want to see. Yeah. Question number three, Willow Rennie. Yes, to ask the Deputy First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. Deputy First Minister. Issues of importance to the people of Scotland. Um, can I thank the Deputy First Minister for her expressions of sympathy towards the Portsmouth workers, as well as those in Glasgow who are losing their jobs and in Portsmouth losing their yard. I think everyone here is arguing with sincerity about the future of Scottish shipbuilding. The big problem for the Deputy First Minister is that what she has said today to Joanne Lamont is not what she has said in the past about procuring ships. Look at what she said about fisheries protection vessels before she was a minister. She said, and I quote, it should be reclassified as a grey ship in order that the work can simply be given to a Scottish yard. The Sturgeon Shipbuilding Doctrine. Powerfully put, warships should be built inside the national boundary. So she wanted the then Scottish Government to pretend our fishing patrol ships were warships so they could be built here. But now she wants the UK Government to do the opposite. Does she see no inconsistency between what she said then and what she's saying now. Deputy First Minister. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know how closely Willie Rennie has really looked at this issue. I'm not, I'm not arguing uh, that the Type 26 shouldn't have what is called in uh, the technical language the Article 346 exemption. I'm simply saying there is absolutely nothing in the context of an Article 346 exemption that would stop these frigates being built in a Scottish yeah, yard. And the reality is, and the reality that nobody can get away from here, and I actually th thought and think that we should use this as a big advantage for the Clyde, not as something to argue about, is that the Clyde is now not only the best place to build these frigates, it is the only place yeah. to build these frigates. Now, that's not something I particularly uh, relish. I, I, as I said earlier on, I'm deeply sorry for Portsmouth as a result of the announcement yesterday, but it makes the Clyde the only place to build uh, these kind of ships. That is the reality. Let me quote somebody in the Times this morning, Alec Ashbourne Walmsley, a London-based defence consultant. Portsmouth on its own simply doesn't have the capacity to build a new class of large complex warships. So if Portsmouth doesn't have it, the only place in the UK that does have it is the Clyde, and that's something we should say is good for the Clyde. Well, there any? Uh, I know a little bit about defence. I sat on the defence committee for a number of years and also represented Rosyth. So I know one or two things um, about Rosyth. Can I say that the, when she talks about it being placed in another country, that would open it to competition, which is the whole point about Korea and the Korea Yards. That was open competition that the British Yards didn't even compete for. And those, the frigates are complex warships. The fleet tankers are not, and she should know that, and if she doesn't understand it, she needs to go back and get a little bit more advice. Her own doctrine says warships should be built inside the state boundary. And Article 346, as she says, it makes clear that that can happen. Can I remind her what she said back on the fishing patrol vessels? She said that the patrol ships should be reclassified so that what can simply be put to a Scottish Yard. But she expects the UK Government to ignore that doctrine. Do as I say, not as I do. 
the problem is, this is her gamble. This is the gamble that the rest of the UK will do the opposite of what she would do herself. I want the relationship between the Royal Navy and the Clyde to continue to deliver jobs and opportunities. Doesn't her gamble put that at risk? Deputy First Minister. Willie Rennie fails as both Joanne Lamon and Ruth Davidson has failed to say where else other than the Clyde these ships would be built, but we'll leave that to one side at the moment. He's just plain wrong on Article 346. Let me quote it to him. Uh, and it's uh, subsection 1b any member state may take such measures as it considers necessary. I'm not arguing that that article shouldn't apply. What I'm saying is that if the UK government considers it necessary to award a contract to BAE and then for reasons of value for money and because it's the only place to build them, BAE says they should be built on the Clyde, there's nothing in Article 346 that stops that happening. Exactly. That's the reality. Look, I say to <laughs> Willie Rennie, uh, I, and what I'm about to say here, I say more in sorrow than in anger, yeah. because I wish Alistair Carmichael the best in his new post. I had a great relationship with his predecessor, uh, but I thought his behaviour yesterday was shameful. Dreadful. He's the Secretary Dreadful. of State for Scotland. His job is to stand up for Scottish interests. He's quoted in the Portsmouth Press this morning talking about taking jobs away from Scotland. Oh. That's disgraceful. I hope he would amend his approach to the job quickly, and I hope Willie Rennie would never follow it. I have uh, been indulgent and allowed the questions and answers for this very, very important subject, but we have very little time to get through the rest of the questions. Could I ask, therefore, that the questions are brief and so are the answers? Question four, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, President. Officer. Unfortunately, I've got to read here, which is quite long. To ask the, First Minister what the Scot Deputy First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on Shelter Scotland's statement that around 5,000 children will be housed in temporary accommodation over Christmas and that the law must be changed to enable families to challenge inadequate temporary accommodation. Deputy First Minister. Uh, one child in unsuitable temporary accommodation is one more than any of us would want to see. Uh, since 2008, there's been an 85 per cent reduction in the number of families with children housed in B&Bs, but there is clearly more work to do and we are doing it. We're working through a stakeholder advisory group with COSA, local authorities and stakeholders like Shelter. That group will report their findings next month. Christine Graham. Uh, can I thank Deputy First Minister for her answer. Given that this issue undoubtedly will be exacerbated by the bedroom tax and welfare cuts and that research by Shelter Scotland has shown that children who are in this temporary accommodation are two to three times more likely to be absent from school due to disruption. Can I ask her to accelerate the use um, of her, her discussions with COSLA and local authorities so that the use of this temporary accommodation is so limited because it's so damaging to children with many other consequences? Deputy First Minister. Uh, yes, I can give Christine Graham that assurance. The uh, group that I spoke about includes COSLA and local authority representatives and we will work with them uh, to try to prevent the use of B&Bs. There's no doubt the welfare uh, cuts agenda of the coalition government is making these matters uh, worse, but we will continue to do all that we can to further alleviate uh, and eradicate this problem. Question 5, Ken McIntosh. To ask the, First Minister, the Deputy First Minister, in light of the recent report by the Educational Institute of Scotland, what action the Scottish Government is taking to address the use of zero-hours contracts in the higher education sector? Deputy First Minister. Uh, the EIS campaign is very welcome. It is, uh, of course, the case that universities are autonomous institutions. They set their own terms and conditions, but the EIS survey uh, does make for worrying reading. Uh, I was very pleased to see that Edinburgh University had reached an agreement with the University and Colleges Union to review its use of zero hours contracts. I think that shows that the issue can be resolved. The Scottish Funding Council has also contacted University Scotland and Colleges Scotland to discuss what support can be provided to share good practice. Employment law, of course, is currently reserved to Westminster, but under the Procurement Reform Bill, uh, we'll see statutory guidance to encourage good employment practices by allowing a company's approach to workforce-related matters to be considered when assessing their suitability to bid for public sector contracts. Okay, McIntosh. For her answer, but can I ask when her government will show the sort of leadership in this issue that Scotland expects? Her ministers and her government already defend, uh, continue to defend the use and the awarding of government grants to multinational companies that use zero hours contracts. We now know that at least 8,000 people are working on these contracts in higher education, a further 1,000 in further education. 
I've discovered through FOIs that at least 27,000 people are working in the devolved public sector. That's the area for which this government has entire responsibility. 27,000 people working on zero-hours contracts. When will the, the Deputy First Minister uh, show the sort of leadership we, we demand and end this invidious employment practice? Deputy First Minister. I think I've made very clear. I think the First Minister has made it clear, other government ministers have made it clear, we deprecate and condemn the inappropriate use of zero hours contract. Well, you know, I've just read out in uh, my first answer uh, what uh, progress has been made within the university sector. Not enough, we need to do more uh, and action that the Scottish Government is taking through the Procurement Reform Bill. If Ken McIntosh or any other member has evidence they want to share with us, I would be very uh, happy to see that and would welcome receipt of that. Again, you know, this is another area where it's easy to throw brickbats at each other and we all do it myself included. But let's also try sometimes to work together. We all agree yeah. zero hours contracts and their inappropriate use is yeah. unacceptable. So let's agree to work together to try to do something real about it. Yeah, yeah. Question six, Margaret Fraser. Uh, thank you. To ask the Deputy First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on the student awards agencies for Scotland's finding that the level of grants paid to university students from the poorest backgrounds has fallen by 3%. Uh, we've put in place a package of measures to guarantee a minimum income of at least £7,250 for all lower income students. Uh, Mike Russell announced last month that from next year that minimum income guarantee will rise by another £250. The SAS figures published on the 29th of October show that in 1213, the year before the minimum income guarantee came into force, there was a small drop in the number of students from low income backgrounds receiving one element of student support, the bursary element, but it also showed that overall the number of students from low income backgrounds below £20,000 receiving support was static at just over £25,000. And of course, I must say that not a single one of these students faces the massive bills of up to £27,000 imposed on students by Conservatives south of the border. Margaret Fraser. Can I thank the Deputy First Minister for her reply. Not only are grants to the poorest students in Scotland falling, but we have a position where participation in higher education in England from those from the most deprived groups is consistently higher than it is in Scotland, and in England it is actually on the increase. So will the Deputy First Minister now accept, in light of this incontrovertible evidence, that the oft-repeated mantra from our party colleagues that students' uh, fees or graduate fees are not deterring those from uh, less well-off backgrounds in England from accessing universities because their record is better than ours? See, any, any Tory that comes to this chamber and tries to lecture us on access to university yeah. education really does have a brass neck given tuition fees south of the border. Let me, give him, let me give him two statistics that perhaps slightly change the picture he was trying to paint. 18-year-olds from most, the most disadvantaged areas in Scotland are 60% more likely to apply to university under this government. The minimum income guarantee that I spoke about uh, earlier on has been described not by any of us but by NUS Scotland as the best support package in the whole of the UK. So I think we are doing it the right way in Scotland. Can we do it better? We can always do things better, but I will never, ever, ever take lessons from Conservatives about how to get more people into university. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That ends First Minister's questions. I have a point of order from Margaret MacDonald. Deputy Presiding, Presiding Officer, rather, I apologise. You said that you had a good number of backbenchers who were interested in putting questions and debating the shipyards, the position of the shipyards. I was elected 40 years ago today for Govan, and the trouble was then the shortage of orders after the current ships were in the slips. And so, therefore, it's an old problem. Many folk know about it, and we could have a constructive debate in here about where we go in the future. Um, uh, thank you, Ms Macdonald. As I said to you uh, before uh, First Minister's questions, I did have a number of backbenchers. I felt that um, I had given almost 25 minutes to the subject. I think it reflected the importance of the issue. I do regret that the backbenchers uh, did not get in. However, I am sure that you will speak to your business manager to raise the issue at the Bureau if you wish a debate next week. That ends First Minister's questions. I now allow a short pause to allow members who are not participating in the debate to leave for the public gallery to clear before we move on to members' business.